first I want to just recapitulate what she says about Hans Georg Gadamer's hermeneutics, just to have it on the table. Um, this is from that first introductory section to this chapter. So here's what she's trying to avoid. Coakley's trying to come up with a way to do theology in conversation with, and theology that takes as its point of departure, some visual, artistic depictions of the doctrines at issue. So, she wants to see how Christians throughout Christian history have depicted the Trinity, and use those depictions to inform what she's doing theologically, to allow them to speak in some way. In order to do that successfully as a theologian, she feels that she has to avoid two false options. The first thing is she can't just limit herself to whatever the original artist intended to do with the painting or the icon or whatever or the sketch or whatever it is. To do that would straightjacket our contemporary theological reflection. We couldn't make anything of the art object on our own. We would be limited to just figuring out, well, what did this individual painter or icon writer intend to do with this particular painting? There are good philosophical questions to ask about whether or not it's even possible to perfectly access what an author's or an artist's intent was in creating an art object or writing a novel. These are larger hermeneutical questions, which is why I'm moving back and forth in my comments between the written word and artistic uh, depiction. In any case, there's good reason to query whether or not it's even possible to access an author's intent. Regardless, Coakley thinks that it would be death to her theological project if we were rigidly and dogmatically tied to whatever it is that the author intended, that the artist intended, or just however the people who first saw this art object in its own cultural milieu thought of the art object. We don't need to be tied to that in any deterministic way. On the other hand, she wants to avoid saying that anything goes as a result. She doesn't want to say that you just kind of have a text or you just have a painting and we can just make of it anything that we want to make of it. There are constraints. Somehow there are constraints on what it is that we can make of an art object. Um, there's quite a bit of interpretation that can be done, but that interpretation is always occasioned by a discrete object, by a discrete painting. You know, just because I can interpret the color, let's just say I've got a picture of a sky. Just because I can interpret the color blue in 15 different ways doesn't mean that I can make the color blue the color green. I might be able to make it a, something in between green and blue, and so play with it a little bit. Do you guys see what I mean? There's some sort of constraint that the art object would put on our interpretation, our contemporary interpretation. It limits it in some way. So those are the two things she wants to avoid. She wants to avoid, on the one side, the idea that the only thing we can make of an art object is whatever it's creators or its original viewers, let's say, made of it. And on the other side, she wants to avoid uh, the suggestion that, that this means that contemporary viewers can make of an art object just whatever they want to make. We can look at a picture of a cross and say, oh, it's a dog. And we might have reason to think that the cross is a dog, but you would have to make an argument about how to, why to interpret it in that way, etc. So, it's open, <coughs> but constrained. The way that she does this is by appealing to this guy named Gadamer in a book called Truth and Method. Gadamer was primarily concerned with the reading of texts, but it's because uh, it's a larger hermeneutical theory. It's a theory of what it means to interpret something. But she's applying this; she thinks it's directly applicable to art in general. The key phrase from Gadamer is that interpretation, or reading, or viewing is a fusion of horizons. So we have a horizon. We have a culture. We have a point of view. We have a perspective. This point of view and this perspective is 21st century. 
many of us lived through a great deal of the 20th century too, so we've got some 20th century bits which have, which have been consolidated in our horizon. We have a particular position within the society that we occupy. We have a perspective, right? I think it's pretty natural for us to think this way. We have a perspective. This perspective is our horizon. But a work of art or a novel also has a perspective. It has a horizon of its own, a horizon of whatever historical and cultural situation it came out of. There's no getting away from our horizon. We can't take ourselves out of our perspective. We see from where we see. There's no view from nowhere. So we can't escape our horizon, but likewise we can't erase the horizon of the art object. We can't pretend, well I suppose we could pretend, we ought not pretend that the art object doesn't itself have a certain cultural situation. I think that's all I want to say there. So there's no, there's no going back to that historical situation, right? You can't put yourself perfectly back in, let's say, the 15th century and look at one of those pain of God that that painting meant in that moment. Why? Because you can't escape your own stuff, your own horizon to that, to the horizon of the artwork. What you have is you have a fusion of those horizons. It allows for her to take seriously a painting's historical situation, its significance in its own time period, etc. While also saying that, you know, we as modern readers might see things or realize things, we might realize meanings of the painting that go beyond whatever its original historical viewers or even its creator intended or realized themselves. Does that make some sense? Okay, great. That's what she's doing. She also is trying to say in that first introduction, introductory section, that there's something about the artistic, qua artistic, that escapes language as such. There's a kind of irreducibility to an art object. There's a materiality to it that resists its translation into words. So even while she's giving us her own interpretation of these art objects in this chapter, she's basically giving us a record of her own fusion of horizons, right, with these different paintings, icons, etc. She's admitting from the very beginning that there is going to be something that escapes all of those interpretations because there just is something that escapes signification, escapes language and words anyway in art as such. So there's some stuff in that first chapter. There's, there's a lot of the use of the word semiotic, which is a word that comes from a psychoanalytic discourse and has been used by feminist psychoanalysts quite a lot to talk about the way that um, the way that the feminine can kind of erupt through masculine modes of thinking. I think that's all I'm going to say about that. If you'd like to talk more about that psychoanalytic heritage, then I would love to discuss it with you. In any case, that's kind of what she's doing. What we should take away from it is that there's something irreducible about a painting or an icon or just a visual depiction in general. Something irreducible, in fact, about all art. And over the course of her systematic, she's going to appeal to different sorts of art. There's going to be a volume that uses poetry. That's the next volume. Uh, and then there's going to be a volume that uses music. And then there's going to be, in the last volume, the use of the liturgy, which she sees as kind of the marriage of all these different art forms into one embodied event. That's the reason why she thinks the theologian should appeal to them. It's because there's something that we can access and tap into through art that we can't tap into through words. So, there are four, I think, key argumentative points being made over the course of the chapter through her reading of all these individual art objects. And I, I told you guys to kind of to read the first part of the chapter and then dip your toe into the water in different places, um, and then we would have a chance to kind of put the picture together. 
these are the four points that I think are going to contribute to the rest of the book. Um, and it clarifies certain parts of the argument that has preceded this chapter. Um, after I go through these four points, we'll get to delve into the artwork ourselves and fuse our own horizons, not simply with the text, but with the original, these paintings and icons um, ourselves for a little bit. So the first thing that I think she's trying to teach us, the first thing that I think is revealed through her exploration of visual depictions of the doctrine of the Trinity, which is what she's doing, is that art surfaces more than doctrine can express. And I don't just mean this in the kind of positive sense that I was just giving it. Uh, a moment ago when I said there's something about art that's irreducible and that escapes signification. We can tap into something that's impossible to tap into simply through words themselves. What I mean by this is that, but also that art can show us symptoms of theological thinking that might be contrary to the actual doctrinal stipulations of theologians. It's really wordy. Let me see if I can say it in a better way. When theologians say God has no gender, and theologians always say that, God is not gendered, God has no sex, God doesn't have a body, so God has no gender. They say that, God has no gender, or they say something like, God the Father is not a human father, it's not human fatherhood that we're talking about, we're just talking about fatherhood. We'll return to this question in that last chapter, the one on which we're going to spend three, four weeks. But when theologians say, God's not gendered, when you take that doctrine, when you take the doctrine of the Trinity, and you try to paint God, you try to paint the Trinity, why is it that so often it's two men and a bird? Right. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's what I mean by art can surface the way in which doctrines, in fact, have meanings, they consolidate meanings which outstrip their the actual stipulation of those doctrines in their theologies. You can say God's not gendered all day long, but when you try to depict this doctrine visually and you end up with two men and a bird, that would seem to suggest, well, maybe God is gendered after all. Or maybe your thinking about God is gendered, even though you swear up and down that it's not. That's the that's the concern. Coakley doesn't think that God has gender in that kind of simple way, as we'll see. Um, but I think the concern for her is that theological thought might in fact be gendered in the imagination, and you don't think that it is, or you're able to um, you're able to tell those silly feminists, no, 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 no. You just don't understand. God doesn't have gender. These are metaphors or analogies or something like that. And in reality, you're still thinking of two men and a bird in your head. So that's what I mean there. And there are a couple of things that she points out. Um, there are a couple of examples of these. One of these is the fact that theologians so often say, God isn't a male because God doesn't have gender, but then you get two men and a bird. The other thing that you can get is um, you can lose the Holy Spirit, right? Theologians can swear up and down that they're still doing justice to the Spirit, that the Spirit is just as much a person as the Father and the Son. But when you get into some of those depictions, particularly I'm thinking of the the uh, the, um, the throne of grace, where the Father is holding the Son on the cross, right? So many of those depictions don't have a Spirit at all. She was talking about her colleague um, from a university teach at saying, Hunt the Pigeon. Because so often, you can't even find a depiction of the Holy Spirit. Or when you do find a depiction of the Holy Spirit, sometimes it's the Blessed Virgin Mary instead of the Holy Spirit at all. Even though all of these theologians would swear up and down, no, 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 the Spirit's totally as, the Spirit's just as much of a person as the Father and the Son. That's not what we mean. But whenever people who read or who live through, who live out these theologies, begin to paint those theologies, they end up privileging the Father and the Son. I never quite understood what Coakley meant from chapter 3, um, the chapter on the patristic heritage, 
about um, the temptation to render the story of the Trinity a drama between the Father and the Son alone until I saw those depictions of the throne of grace where literally the whole story is a drama between the father and the son or that painting where um where the pigeon is um looks perturbed you know it's the father and the son over here and they're having a conversation and the pigeon is over here on top of the blessed virgin and they're both like they're trying to like crane in to hear what the father and the son are saying anyway it's just a fantastic depiction of what is in fact going on in these theologies, even if the theologians say it's not going on. It's a marvelous method for doing theology. So the second is this idea that the feminization, femininization, that's fine, whatever, feminization, the making feminine of the spirit or the inclusion of the feminine in the 3-3 three, three by the Blessed Virgin does not automatically mean liberation for women. This is terribly important. This is a point that she makes, I think, very persuasively. And it's important because you will hear you will hear well-meaning clergy talk like this all the time. Well-meaning teachers, well-meaning theologians, etc. And I don't mean to disparage their well-meaningness. They're, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, it's very well-intentioned. What Coakley shows is that, let's take the example of the feminization of the spirit first. So it is sometimes said, it's sometimes said that, you know, the father and the son, okay, we say they're technically not male, but if those are the kind of gender connotations of the father and the son, then the way to fix that would be to get the feminine up into God in some way. And there's this, uh, there is this heritage of calling the spirit feminine, using a female pronoun for the spirit, etc. And you've had contemporary theologians who've made this same sort of con concession, not simply feminist theologians, but also theologians like uh, she mentions the Roman Catholic Eve Congar, who says, yeah, sure, the, the spirit is feminine. That's probably a good thing. Making the spirit feminine really doesn't do women much good if you install a hierarchy between the father, the son, and the spirit. The spirit comes last in so many of these theologies. And so then people are like, oh, well, yeah, sure, the feminine's up in God, but the feminine is the one who comes about last. The feminine is not the source, God the father. And so you actually, you see this doctrinally in the theologies of somebody like von Balthasar. Von Balthasar says, yes, of course, the spirit can be feminine because the spirit, among all three Trinitarian persons, is the one who is most passive. The spirit never, oh, how does it, I can say it backward. A person never proceeds from the spirit, right? So we can say that the son and the spirit proceed from the father, the spirit on a Western accounting anyway, proceeds from the Father and the Son. We say that in the... So, okay, yeah, sure. The Spirit could be feminine. But do you see how hierarchy is re... Actually, a subordination of women is reinstalled by way of the, the very affirmation that the Holy Spirit is feminine. In addition, she sees this acted out in... Um, she sees this displayed through the art that she's reading. We can talk about that in a minute when we look at some particular examples. The other thing she's skeptical of is this idea that by putting the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Trinity, this is famously the, the thought of Carl Jung, that you fix the Trinity. So Jung, she refers to him quite a bit in the footnotes. The general idea is that Jung thinks that the self needs four components. So there was always kind of a problem with the Trinity, psychologically. Uh, there was always something wrong with the Trinity because it only had three, and you really need four. And so he thought that by in this uh, Catholic dogma of the Assumption of Mary, um, which was promulgated in the 20th century, um, it's relatively recent in that sense, um, but it does the sentiment predates that formal promulgation by the hierarchy. Um, he thought that in the in that dogma, the Assumption of Mary. You finally got four in God, which was it worked perfectly with his with his theory of the self. He also thought that it got femininity up into God, 
do you remember that the, the throne room painting where you have the three identical uh, they're like they're like triplets they're like three it's like three identical men sitting on their thrones and then you got Mary over here and Coakley was saying that if you looked at the another painting by the same artist you would see it, the, you would see that Mary is crowned by those three men so you have her coronation which subordinates Mary to the three men of the Trinity. Um, but even if you just look at that, even if you just look at the throne room scene, Mary's chair is just a little bit lower than the other three. That's because they're constrained by orthodoxy. You can't have four in a trinity. There's just no way. You could do the young thing, but it wouldn't be orthodox. So if you're going to maintain orthodoxy, you're going to have three persons in the trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and there is just no way to put Mary inside the Trinity in that way. Mary is always human. She is an incredible human being. She's perhaps an incredibly unique human being, but always a human being. Unless your Mariology becomes heretical. You could do that. But what we see in these paintings is the, is the need to soft pedal the Mariology even when it gets really, really, really high. So again, Mary in the Trinity, maybe not as automatically liberating for women as it might seem. What she does find interesting in the actual viewing and reading of these images is that the sketchiness of gender seems to be a good thing. She calls it, and she talks about it as being a kind of anonymity, right? She talks about this in particular with Hildegard's painting at the end, and with the, um, with the William, Blank, William Blake painting, which is on the cover of your books. There's something about the figure of Jesus. It's, she says it's not like, it's not like, a, but it's something about the fact that the ambiguity of the figure's gender allows us to read both men and women into it. And it's interesting because with Blake, the Blake painting is literally a sketch. And so it's the idea that this sketchiness of gender is what allows us to read both masculinity and femininity into God. You should recognize there the decisions she made regarding gender from very early on in the book, right? Where gender is supposed to be rendered labile, fluid. Gender is supposed to be rendered sketchy in some sense. Fourth, and the most important for that last chapter that we're going to spend so much time on, is about movement. She talks a lot when she's, um, oh, she talks about it with, um, with Rublev's Trinity icon. She talks about it with Joachim of Fiore's painting of, the, you know, you remember the three circles, one being the Father, the next being the Son, the next being the Holy Spirit. And then she talks about it, um, she discusses it with regard to that last final painting, the Schultz. If we think about the Think about the Joachim painting itself. We just take it as our example. Remember, it kind of looks like this. There's a circle, there's a circle, there's a circle. And then it says, Father, Son, and Spirit at the top. There's still a kind of order, right? You're reading the painting, say, from left to right. Father still comes first, and then the Son, and then the Spirit. But there's also a sense, she says, there's a sense in which your eye gets caught up in the circles, in the movement of the painting. That your eye begins to move back and forth. And this movement of the eye, she says, disturbs or disrupts some of the obvious 
hierarchy of the image, some of the obvious order, right? So if you start over here and you go over here, then it looks like the Father comes first, then the Son, then the Spirit. But you get caught up in these circles and your eye continues to move over the image, destabilizing that original sense of, well, it's as simple as Father first, Son second, Spirit third. The more powerful example, I think, is this... Oh, she she uses the she uses the painting as an exposition or an, um, an illustration of the Cappadocians Trinitarian theology. Find it. This one got my attention. It's on page 236. It's from the 14th century. Does anybody have a book they could look through? So you see, the father is clearly the biggest one, right? Inside, in the father's lap, is the son. And then there's the pigeon. But... The way that the pigeon is against this black backdrop makes it really difficult to move your eye anywhere else in the painting, doesn't it? When I looked at this the first time, it was really stunning to me because I thought, oh, okay, she's right. Or actually, um, it's, this, uh, it's this block quote, which is from an email that she had with, um, with Graham Ward, one of, the, one of her colleagues. There's a sense in which the obvious linear hierarchy between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is disrupted by the fact that your eye obsesses with the Spirit. If you look at the painting and you just approach it, I personally find it difficult to look anywhere else on first glance than the Spirit because of that stunning dark circle. It's where my eye naturally goes first even if the Father is the biggest one. In any case, what I think we see through these sorts of examples, and they're, they're scattered throughout the chapter, is that there's something about movement that can disrupt the obvious linear hierarchy between Father, Son, and Spirit. This is going to play an important role in her own proposal about how to think about the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in the last chapter. So just remember the stuff here about, just remember the discussion of eye movement. Because technically, you keep the ordering, right? Technically, in that photo, the father's still the biggest, the father is behind, and the son is in his lap, and then the spirit is in the son's lap. But there's something about the materiality of the art object that subverts that linear order. 